The Chaplin Mystery. Jekyll or Hyde, millionaire or vagrant, an outsider resembling no one, yet so close to us all. Cheeky Chaplin, lovable Chaplin. Chaplin the tramp, at once actor, wizard, and acrobat. Chaplin the complete auteur, producer, writer, director, and star of a unique comic universe. More than any other artist in the history of the movies, Chaplin was, for half a century, the master puppeteer of his own marionette. In 1928, Charlie Chaplin embarked on the adventure of City Lights. It was a time when the great cities grew increasingly heartless. Wall Street raced out of control, leaving the nation's poor by the wayside, while in Europe, Fritz Lang's metropolis had given birth to a politically and socially engaged cinema. In City Lights, Chaplin sought to preserve his style by telling a simple story of love and hope between two lost souls in the big city. Chaplin would again be the tramp, and the young blind woman, for whom he cast a newcomer named Virginia Cheryl, would play a humble flower girl. A unique, universal film figure, Chaplin was also a great pantomime artist, a master of movement. As early as 1916, as in this now forgotten cartoon series, he inspired the great names in film animation. In time, he would be seen in the company of Felix the Cat, Pat Sullivan, and even in this strange balloon land dreamed up by the father of Mickey Mouse. The character of the Tramp, which he tried and tested in the school of the British Music Hall as a member of the Fred Carnot Company, went far beyond the cane, the derby hat, and the worn-out shoes. A master of acrobatics and mime, Chaplin put his silhouette through many an absurd and unlikely contortion. Wasn't this exaggeration of gesture also one of the features of cartoon characters? Here he is again in 1980, the subject of an amusing pastiche tinged with a shared nostalgia for the home movie screenings of our grandfathers. Under the direction of Peter Lord, Morph, the small plasticine character, and his friends, enjoy a typical little farce improvised by his favorite character, Charlie. We paid a visit to Peter Lord, who has since gone on to found the Ardman Studios in Bristol, where, with his colleague Nick Park, he produced and co-directed the now classic animation films Chicken Run and Wallace and Gromit. But first, shh, here are a few images from Charlie Chaplin's last silent movie. Well, clearly Chaplin absolutely profoundly believed in silent filmmaking. Of course he did, and, um, and he did it, you know, better than anyone. He didn't want to change. It's interesting, with City Lights, at the start of City Lights, he, he, he plays a, uh, a joke on, on his audience and on his industry by having some sync sound, apparently, of uh, some people giving speeches. We associate Charlie with being silent and the tramp with being silent. It's, it's how we understand him, you know, with, with a piano playing in the background, that's how we understand him. Um, could he have talked? I, uh, I don't, I'm glad he didn't. I'm very glad he didn't. I think it would have been positively shocking. In 1928, Chaplin's greatest challenge had a name. The Jazz Singer, the first talking motion picture in film history whose success exceeded all expectations. When he began shooting in September, Chaplin was fully aware that the public was now demanding only sound pictures. From the moment Al Jolson uttered his first words, silent cinema became an anachronism. And I want to tell you this is an all singing, talking and dancing picture. A lot of laughs. You were all the way through it. 
The very foundations of Hollywood were shaken. The landscape had changed and audiences wanted to hear actors talk. Could the Tramp, a product of the British music hall tradition of the 1910s, learn to speak? The public was hopeful, but Chaplin was wary. So he decided. City Lights would contain no talking, but it would be heard. He composed the music and sound effects for the film, and at the film's world premiere on January 30th, 1931, the audience roared its approval. My background as an animator was in silent material. In fact, in my case, n not because I'm 100 years old, but because we were working for a TV program for deaf children. That was the first job I had. And, it, and that trained you, like the silent cinema, to, to communicate without words, without, without sound effects. And that's a fantastic discipline. It's, sometimes I think it's a tyranny as well, but, but somehow in Chaplin's hands it, was, it, it wasn't a tyranny, it was a, a triumphant thing. What has the human body got to play with? You know, you've got your face, of course, and Chaplin uses that beautifully, but you have particularly the, the, the tilt of the shoulders and the tilt of the hips and the weight. Um, I must admit that instinctively, I'd like to work with a puppet that was more like Chaplin, that had every every joint, you know, because um, I like I like a cat that can shrug its shoulders and hunch its shoulders and um, slump its spine. All these things that chickens can't do. Mrs. Sweetie, the chickens are. Uh, I, I, lo I love those things because I think, to me. That's the, that's the language of vis visual communication. Chaplin was a perfectionist. He knew that the simplest gag required clockwork timing. Here he is, elaborating on his familiar gestures in a typical slapstick scene, the store window. But Chaplin has left us a document about his work methods. Here, in Counterpoint, is the rehearsal footage for the same scene shot a few days earlier. And um, I actually am very jealous, very, very jealous of his way of working, whereby he would have the actors in front of him and could watch them acting the scene time and time again and looking, looking, looking for the perfect way to tell the story. One of Chaplin's great strengths was his independence. Owning his own studios and being under no obligations to the major Hollywood companies, he was free to choose his materials and decide on his production timetable. As he worked out each scene, he fine-tuned the performances of his actors in the course of interminable rehearsals, sometimes taking months to get a key scene right. The first meeting between the tramp and the flower girl and the misunderstanding it gives rise to required more than 300 takes. In this sense, it is typical of his method. That silent slam that we couldn't hear, because it's a silent film, is the thing that suggests to her that the man walking past is a rich man who's got out of a limousine rather than the tramp. And that, that misunderstanding runs through the rest of the film now.
now he realises, and now it hits him. It's just such, it's such a lovely piece of storytelling. It's so clever, and it's so simple. It's got a very nice line, beautiful line, between very gentle, heartfelt, real romance and comedy. It's so unexpected, because he, he's brought you to a high pitch of a certain sort of emotion, and then does it break it? No, it doesn't. It takes you to the next scene, is what it does. But what I just wanted to observe, that I think this, there's something very English about this to me, about this the gentleman tramp and um there's a there's a an english musical song about a gentleman tramp and he and it says i live in trafalgar square with four lions to guard me fountains and statues all over the place and the metropole staring me right in the face i own it's a trifle drafty but i look at it this way you see if it's good enough for nelson it's quite good enough for me and I think of this is this is this is the gentleman tramp when he when he dusts the, when he dusts the uh, this bench, which is presumably where he lives, you know. He's kind of, uh, and I think that I, I can imagine that playing in the in the Edwardian English musicals, and I think that's what Charlie's doing here. Part of the richness of the film is there are all these lovely sight gags the whole time, which one gem after another. Um, and here, this is this is surprising as well. Now he's he's gone through various adventures, but he's still the tramp. He's still the guy that is always looking for a, a cigarette butt, a cigar butt, even though he's dressed in very very smart clothes now. We know Chaplin from childhood. Maybe that means yes. Maybe that does mean that as viewers we we are you know quite literally taken back to that first viewing experience. Um, and then of course there is something very childlike about Chaplin. Indeed, the tramp is a child. When he puts on a cape, he becomes a musketeer. And when, as in this scene, he gets into a millionaire's suit, he knows exactly how to behave as the perfect gentleman. He's, again, he's embarrassed, the English gentleman embarrassed. And now, now he's acting a part again. Now he's no longer the tramp. He, now he is, he is the gentleman. And suddenly, a crazy child, you know, just, just, <laughs> and there's no exact logic in it. There's no, it's not about logic, is it? It's, it's about, but it's better than logic, because it's, because it, it's charming, that, and that's who he is. Char he's the combination of those things. He is the performer, he is the guy that wants to be uh, a millionaire, and he is the child all at once. City Lights is one of the high points of Chaplin's art. The story of the tramp and the blind flower girl serves as a romantic framework for a series of comic tour de forces, many of which draw on the finest moments of his early theatre and film work. The prize fight, Chaplin's last chance to find the money for the operation that can restore his sweetheart's sight, is a superb example of how he perfected one of the uproarious comic set pieces of his formative years. The way I connect what Chaplin does with movement 
with animation is I think that what he's doing is finding the right line, the perfect line, between exaggeration and naturalism. And I just think somehow you need those two things for comedy. You need naturalism because you need to absolutely believe in him and understand what he's doing, what he's, you know, where he's coming from. He needs to be grounded in absolute reality. And then exaggeration, I think, is where the humour comes. So that when he's fighting, uh, when he was boxing, you know, his arms are going around like this, you know, like at like windmills, taking these great swinging punches. That's not natural, you know. That, that's that's comically exaggerated. And he knew when to do that, and he knew when to stop and slow down and be tiny. So the whole the whole boxing match is absolute tour de force. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, I love the way he plays at the start of the scene because boxers don't do that, do they? The boxers aren't meant to help the seconds get into, into the ring. Um, carrying his own bucket around, looking so miserable with the terrible boots and the terrible jacket and the terrible hat. And then... <laughs> and then the fact he has to be... Because he's terrified, he's going to get beaten to a pulp, he knows. So he has to be very, very nice to everybody. So when it, come, when it comes to the shaking hands, he's so keen. The, other, the great thing he does is he, he looks a, a frightened and B confused the whole time. There were other silent comics, other great ones as well, and especially Keaton. You know, and those two often compared to each other. Um, so why was Chapman so great? Which I think, he, I believe, he was so great. And I think it's, um, I think it's, it's to do with his range, because he could do so many things so well that he could do, because he could do the love scenes um, very beautifully which Keaton sort of didn't attempt, frankly, so much. He cares deeply about the love story. It's, it is what the film is about, it's how the film ends. Um, but he has an instinct, so sort of irrepressible instinct, to be funny. Now the ex excellent sight gag with it, or, or, or the audio gag rather, where he keeps ringing the bell by the episode four, and then more than happy to go to the corner. Oh, babe, ready for a fight again? It's just fantastic the way he just turns in an instant, in a, in a, a flash of activity, and then incredibly. He loses. It's, it's terrible, you know. And and, you know, and, it, and in losing, it seems that his whole life is ruined. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful scene. Charlie loses the fight, but then the millionaire returns and gives him the money out of friendship and gratitude. Wrongly accused of burglary, he brings his beloved the money that will pay for her operation. Before being hauled off to prison, he comes to make her this final gift, but also to say goodbye. The final scene. A few months later, the tramp has just been released from prison. He wanders the streets of this now lightless city. The girl, having recovered her sight after the operation, today runs her own flower shop, but still 
She is unaware of the identity of her rich benefactor. Chaplin's relations with his actress, Virginia Cheryl, were never good. She was 20 years old, frivolous, and did not share his enthusiasm for the film. One day, the novice actress would even ask permission to leave the set early because of an appointment with her hairdresser. Though the film was almost completed, Chaplin angrily dismissed her. He did screen tests with Georgia Hale, his partner from The Gold Rush. But the production was too far along. He saw no choice but to reinstate Cheryl. And it was a good thing he did. The simplicity of her performance, her naivete and candor would make all the difference. Where a seasoned actress might overact, Virginia was content just to present herself. Rather than showing, she suggested. And it is undoubtedly this simplicity of performance that gives its power and magic to one of the most indescribably moving and captivating scenes in all of Chaplin's work. feel awkward talking about the final scene because it's it's just so perfect as it is that but no what does a comment add you know it, it's so simple um, what's great about it is the understatement of the performance is is one thing and uh, that, that it is it it finishes off the whole story it's the, it's the ending that we have come to long for, although we don't know how it's going to end. 